Chapter 2 Consequentialist or Teleological Theories of Morality Ethicists consider a number of different moral or ethical theories, and they have divided the theories they consider into two categories. The first category is the consequentialist or teleological category. Consequentialists believe that morality is based on or concerned with consequences. When we speak of based on the consequences, the, the result, the consequence, determines whether a act is moral or immoral. And consequentialists are concerned then with the consequences of moral choices, moral actions. The other category is non-consequentialism, deontological approaches to ethics. And we'll be talking about those approaches in chapter three. Briefly, non-consequentialism believes that morality is not based on the consequence of the action. Uh, it is not really fair to say that non-consequentialists are not concerned with the consequences of their action. Uh, we will talk about this in more detail when we get to chapter 3. But our authors state it this way, morality, uh, according to a non-consequentialist, is not based on or concerned with the consequences of a moral choice or action. This chart visualizes the moral theories that we're going to be considering throughout this course. On the left, you have the consequentialist theories, egoethicism, utilitarianism, and humanitarian ethics. We're going to be considering the first two of these theories in chapter two. Humanitarian ethics is the theory that was developed by Jacques Thoreau. It is, in the final analysis, a hybrid form of utilitarianism with a lot of egoethicism thrown in. Uh, it does contain elements from some of the non-consequentialist theories we're going to be looking at, but it is primary, primarily a consequentialist theory. But we won't be dealing with that until we get to chapter 8. Now on the right side of the chart, you have the non-consequentialist theories that we're going to be considering, and we will get to those in chapter 3. This chart is kind of a helpful tool. You might want to print it out and use it when you take tests uh, or when you evaluate the motion pictures or documentaries we're going to be using in this course so that you can keep them straight because it's easy to confuse the, the two categories. A lot of times people will say, well, uh, this person in this movie is a non-consequentialist and they will then describe or identify that same character as an egoethicist. Uh, so it's really easy to confuse these, these categories. So uh, this might be a helpful little tool to print off and keep for future reference. In this chapter, we're going to look at two major consequentialist ethical theories, egoethicism and utilitarianism. Both of these theories agree that human beings ought to behave in ways that will bring about good consequences. You might ask yourself, good consequences for whom? Well, that would bring you to the difference between these two theories. These theories disagree as to who should benefit from the good consequences of a moral action. Egoethicists believe that we should act in our self-interest. If it benefits us, it's good. If it does not benefit us, it is bad. So right and wrong are determined uh, somewhat individualistically. Um, if it is, in my opinion, something that will benefit me, then it's right for me. If it's something that would not benefit me, uh, then it's, it's, it's wrong. 
Utilitarianism would suggest, at least in its present form, that we ought to act in a way that will bring about the greatest good for everyone affected by the moral choice or action. So the one theory says if the consequences are good for you, it's good. The other says if the action is good for the collective, it's good. If it's not something that would be good for the collective, it's bad. We're going to begin by looking at egoethicism. And to do that, we're going to talk about psychological egoism. Psychological egoism is not an ethical theory. It is a descriptive or scientific theory that has to do with, with human ego. It's one of those sociological studies that has been done. Actually, there have been a lot of studies done along these lines. Uh, the social scientist observes what human beings do, and they record what they have observed. The subjectivism comes in when it comes to interpreting the data. The data doesn't lie. But data has to be interpreted by someone. And so various social scientists have looked at the data concerning human egoism, and they have uh, drawn some different conclusions. Strong form psychological egoism says that people always act in their own self-interest. People have looked at the data. They said, that's just the way it is. We uh, were born selfish. We came out of the womb with our fists clenched, demanding that the world serve us, believing that we were the center of the universe. And that is the way we continue to act throughout the course of our lifetime. Everything a human being does is all ultimately done in their own self-interest. The weaker form of psychological egoism would say that people often, or it might say that people generally act in their self-interest, but not always. Sometimes people are able to rise above their own self-interest. People we talked about earlier in this course, Gandhi or Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, would be examples of this, at least examples uh, that someone who holds the weaker form of egoethicism would hold up and say, see, these individuals were not acting in their own self-interest. But someone who holds to the stronger form of egoethicism would say, well, wait a minute, look more closely. Uh, they gain certain things for themselves through their actions, things that perhaps they valued more than the easy life that so many of us value. Maybe they valued the fame, the notoriety, the power that came from their actions. But ultimately, they were seeking their own self-interest. It was in Gandhi's self-interest that India be ruled by Indians rather than by Brits. And Dr. Martin Luther King, after all, he, he was a, an African-American man, and it was to his advantage that he lived in a culture that no longer had Jim Crow laws. And so when looked at more closely, everyone, even those moral heroes that we sometimes hold up uh, before us, uh, when we strip away all of the detail, we find out that they're acting in their self-interest too. Well, a person who holds to a weaker form of egoism might say, what about that person who throws him or herself on a grenade to save uh, his or her buddies from being killed. And it would seem, at least to me, and I think also to the author of our textbook, that the weaker form of egoethicism is probably the better analysis of the data. That, generally speaking, people are selfish. Uh, we do look out for number one, as the old saying goes. But that's not always the case. And sometimes people do self-sacrificial acts, 
sometimes people rise above their self-interest responding to the higher call of conscience. We come now to ethical egoism. Ethical egoism is built on that strong theory of psychological egoism that everyone is ultimately looking out for themselves. And egoethicism says that that's the way it should be. It is a philosophical, normative, prescriptive theory. Now, refresh your memory. What's that? The ethical egoist looks at the culture as it is. It looks at our altruism. It looks at uh, all of the mechanisms that have been built by society to encourage selfless behavior, and it says they're not good. As a matter of fact, they're part of our problem. And so we should move to a society designed to accommodate the fact that everyone is ultimately going to look out for their own self-interest uh, and that altruism is ultimately something that a person can uh, involve themselves in if it makes them feel better, if the people they're seeking to help are important to them. But it all comes down to doing what you see to be in your best interest and understand that other people are doing the same. So you want to move people away from where we, what we have now, this uh, system that celebrates uh, unselfish behavior and altruism, and you want society to become a, a culture that ultimately celebrates uh, selfish behavior and is really designed to accommodate the human animal as the human animal is. And so the prescription for getting there is that we need to begin to move society in the direction of greater selfishness. And we need to do away with the, uh, the ideal we sometimes place before people that, that they are better people if they are uh, selfless. There are three forms of ethical egoism. The first is the individual form. This is how we're born. This is our natural state. We arrive on this planet via the womb and discover that we are not alone. There are other creatures on this planet with us, but our theory is that they exist for our benefit. Uh, they should serve us. When we cry, mom should be there to feed us or hold us or change us or whatever we want. People exist, others exist, even animals exist for our benefit. Now, through the process of socialization, most of us grow out of this, or at least we, we learn how to uh, suppress it. The second form is the form taken by that person who understands the rules of the culture and understands that they need to allow least appear like they respect others and their rights and their needs, but in fact they believe that I as an individual should act in my own self-interest. I don't care what others do, but that's how I am going to live my life. Uh, so they may be very uh, selfish on first glance. We may recognize them and say, what a, what a terrible person. They're completely self-centered. But most people learn to kind of disguise the fact that they are generally selfish, that they're acting in their self-interest, even when they are. And so we sometimes hide our selfishness uh, behind a mask of altruism, the mask that says we care about others and, and uh, their situations and what they care about. At least that's what the egoethicists would say. Uh, but there is a certain dishonesty in personal egoethicism because other people are not necessarily playing by the same rules. And uh, this would be the ultimate then sociopathic or psychopathic behavior. I'm looking out for my own interests. I'm using other people. What they do is pretty much up to them. The universal form of egoethicism is the one that is most common today, and this 
is the view that we are basically selfish creatures. Uh, the social sciences, according to this view, have demonstrated that we always act in our own self-interest, and we should stop pretending that that is not true. And we should consciously act in our own self-interest, and everyone else should act in their self-interest too. So it, it's the marketplace. The person selling is there to make money. He's providing a good or, ser a good or service uh, to make money. The person who is coming to purchase a good or a service from that individual knows that they are there trying to make money, but they're trying to get a, a good price. They're looking for a bargain. They're interested in the goods because it's in their self-interest to have the thing that is being sold, but it's also in their self-interest to get the best price possible. And so there's a negotiation and both sides go away saying, oh, the other one took advantage of me. Both of them, when it works out well, uh, secretly in their heart are feeling pretty good. I got a good price for my product. I, I got a good deal on this product. And so both people are satisfied. Both are seeking their self-interest uh, consciously. And this is what we could call a negotiational approach to life rather than an ideological approach to life. Instead of the old theory that people have a view of life that they believe is right and they're trying to fight for and advance the right, uh, here they're negotiating. Every one of us is in a negotiation process. We should just accept it and that's the way we should do business. The authors of our text argue that it's difficult to determine what is meant by the term everyone. Uh, the term is unclear. Now a universal ego ethicist would say, what is unclear about everyone? Everyone does seek their own self-interest naturally. This is how we started life. This is how we ultimately live our lives. Uh, everyone naturally does this. And so everyone should do this. Nature is right. Uh, we have evolved into selfish creatures. Uh, Richard Dawkins suggested there was a selfishness gene uh, that hasn't been isolated, but perhaps there is such a thing and there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone does, everyone should. That is the uh, nature's way, to quote Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. Uh, the authors say, but you're going to have conflict because if everyone's looking out for their own self-interest, uh, there's going to be a collision here. And you're not ever going to resolve all these things through negotiations. And the inconsistencies may sometimes be the source of those conflicts. And the ego ethicist would say, well, that, that's true. Uh, human beings seeking their own self-interest may come into conflict. But we have in our culture already mechanisms in place to deal with such conflicts. Uh, we have courts of law. And in a society, it is to the advantage of the individuals living in that society to have some uh, level of government. Uh, it, it is not to my personal advantage to live in a society that doesn't have rules against murdering me. It is not to my personal advantage to live in a society that does not have laws against people stealing from me and so forth. And so certainly people living in a, a social construct, even though they're seeking their own self-interest, are going to see the necessity of having certain institutions in place uh, to resolve conflicts. Courts are necessary. Jails, unfortunately, are necessary. Rules of some sort are necessary. And these things are ultimately in my self-interest as a universal ego ethicist. I'm not a universal ego ethicist, but I'm thinking as one here. And, and so naturally, I'm going to want to live in a stable society, a society without murder, a society without uh, you know, pillage, without uh, plunder uh, going on all the time. It is to my advantage to live in a civilization, to be able to go to uh, the theater without uh, fear, to go to a restaurant without fear. And so 
the universal ego ethicist is not necessarily advocating no government. They are not anarchists. Uh, they might find it to their advantage to follow these rules themselves. Uh, in a marketplace, the market will punish the person that is a cad, and it will reward that person who is honest and fair in their dealing. And so although I am committed to telling the truth only when it is to my advantage to do so, it is generally to my advantage to do so. So I can buy into a general rule that honesty is the best policy, even though I don't uh, hold to that old absolutist philosophy that God would have me to live my life in a, in a, uh, a basically honest and upright manner. So a lot of times when we talk about this and students begin to wrestle with the issue, they look at a universal ego ethicist and say, well, they are always villainous. Uh, well, it is true that in drama, all of your villains are ego ethicists. But sometimes in a particular drama, so are the heroes when you really get down to it. A, an ego ethicist need not be a villain. The author goes on to argue that universal ego ethicism is a, a, a theory that makes the giving of moral advice difficult. Well, even if this is true, it would not be an argument, it would be an observation. Lots of things are difficult, that doesn't mean they should not be done. It's difficult for an athlete to put in all the time and effort to earn an Olympic gold medal. That doesn't mean it's not worth doing. So, uh, you know, even if this is a valid argument, it, 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 well, it's not an argument, it's just an observation. Uh, but let's look at the observation uh, through the eyes of a universal ego ethicist. Uh, they would look at this objection and say, uh, you couldn't be more wrong. What is hard about saying as a bit of a moral advice, do whatsoever, whatever is in your self-interest. Figure out what's best for you, and that's the thing you should do. Uh, now, it would be difficult perhaps to give uh, advice, uh, the sort of advice that you get from a traditional counselor. Um, they might tell you in a bad relationship, for example, that you should work on your relationship. Uh, a universal ego ethicist might say if it's to your advantage to work on that, if this is something you really want to do, that's okay. But there's certainly no problem with moving on. And, you know, life is too short. And, uh, the philosophy of uh, the comedian W.C. Field, uh, uh, one of my favorite old-time comedians. He said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And if that doesn't work, give up. There's no point making an ass out of yourself. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's moral advice that would be consistent with your e universal ego ethicism. And once you've bought into the system and you understand the system, uh, the source of advice you would give in that system uh, would be different than other systems, but it would it would work uh, for those committed to the principles of universal ego ethicism. Uh, the authors point out another problem with universal ego ethicism. They say that it blurs the non the moral and the non moral uses of the term ought and should. The universal ego ethicist would say exactly, and what's wrong with that? Uh, they would say we have built up this idea of morality, and it is based on a irrational foundation, the idea that we ought to be interested in others instead of ourselves, you know, do unto others as you would have them to do on yourself. Uh, they, they would say that is not a good foundation the idea that you find fulfillment in doing things for other people. They would say the entire moral system and the language we use to defend and to propagate that system uh, is really not a rational moral language. Uh, we ought to do what is in our self-interest. That might mean that we are not always kind. Uh, that might mean that we are not always gentle or uh, we are not always uh, strictly honest because our self-interest may dictate in certain situations that we not be honest, that we not be gentle, and that we not be honest. So 
they would say, yeah, it blurs the, the normative language that's used to discuss moral and non-moral issues, but that is the now, that is the current norm. And we want to establish ultimately a new norm where moral language is used differently. And selfishness is no longer considered a bad thing, but a good thing, a fundamental aspect of human nature that should be celebrated and indulged. So supporters of egoethicism proudly were the moral, moral and non-moral uses of terms such as ought and should. The author then says, well, this makes universal egoism uh, highly impractical because it creates those conflicts and inconsistencies. At this point, the universal ego egoist would go, man, we've already addressed the conflict thing and the inconsistencies things. Of course, there's going to be inconsistency in the marketplace. Uh, we accept that as a norm. Sometimes that may result in conflict. It is to the individual's advantage to have mechanisms in place to deal with conflict when people cannot uh, resolve those conflicts rationally among themselves. We're not against courts. We're not against all government. And we just frankly disagree with you that universal legal ethicism is impractical. It's very practical. It's different than what we have assumed to be the way things ought to be, but it's ultimately the best way of doing things. Uh, let the market decide uh, when it comes to economic matters, when it comes to interpersonal matters. Uh, there is nothing wrong with being negotiational rather than ideological. Uh, you stand for your higher principles if you want to, if that's what makes you happy. Um, but if I don't agree with you, um, that's my business. You do what makes you happy. I do what makes me happy. You make your rules and live by your rules. I make my rules and live by my rules. And it is to both of our advantage that we have certain shared rules if we're going to have a civilization at all. And it's to my advantage to live in a civilization rather than a cave somewhere. So the universal legal ethicist would say, there's nothing at all impractical about this system. In fact, it's the way the marketplace has worked ever since the first marketplace was created. The authors argue that it is inconsistent with the helping professions. And here they have a point. Uh, the authors say ethical egoism in any form does not provide a proper ethical basis for people in the helping professions. Uh, some people in the professions uh, do, even now, practice their profession out of self-interest. They studied, uh, say, psychiatry in, in college and grad school because they wanted to make a lot of money. And they thought, this is a good way for me to do it. And the ego ethicist would say this already exists. Ultimately, every profession a person goes into can be traced back to the fact that they're doing something that they see to be in their self-interest. Perhaps they really uh, and get a, a thrill out of helping people with their problems. Uh, ultimately, then they would not be in a helping profession if they didn't give that get that feeling of of uh, satisfaction from doing that. They would look for other lines of work. But they like that. It's, they sense it's to my advantage. It's something I desire to have this, this feeling that I've, I've helped someone with their problems in life. Uh, so they would say help, those in the helping professions can uh, be offering genuinely good altruistic counsel to people who desire those services. Um, but they are doing so because it is in their self-interest. On the dark side, if you're paying a therapist $500 an hour, uh, what would be the chances that an egoethicist uh, therapist would ever cure you of your uh, mental 
uh, issues. Uh, so you can argue it both ways, and the universal legal ethicist would say exactly so. Uh, different things make different people happy. Some people really uh, find it satisfying to help other people. Good for them. Others of us uh, don't share that particular value system. Good for us. As we used to say in the 60s, actually there was a a comedy show called Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In, kind of the precursor to Saturday Night Live. And, and one of the sayings they made popular back in the day was different strokes for different folks. And that would be uh, the response of the universal ego ethicist to this particular objection. Uh, so moving through the rest of this slide, uh, the authors object that a highly self-interested person would not serve well in the helping professions. And the universal ego ethicist would say that depends on the individual. Uh, if he's highly motivated to get that wonderful feeling he gets when he helps other people, uh, a universal ego ethicist might be the best counselor in town. The advantages of the universal ego ethicist system and the author says it is easier to determine self-interest. Uh, I would say uh, it is perhaps easier for us to guess. My objection to universal ego ethicism, I'm going to reserve for just a bit. Um, but the author is suggesting, giving some ground here, he says, I suppose a person could figure out what's in their best self-interest easier than I could figure out what is in the interests of others. And so uh, there is certainly an advantage to ego ethicism in that sense, uh, because it is easier for individuals to determine what is in their own self-interest. Uh, the universal ego ethicist would say the best thing about our system is it is a system that encourages the maximum of individual freedom and personal responsibility. They would say the Free a society is obviously the society that has the smallest government, the fewest rules restricting human freedom. Every new law puts a limit on what the individual can do. And so if we accept universal ego ethicism and we order our societies according uh, to these principles, uh, you will find a society that allows the maximum possible uh, amount of human freedom, but you're operating without a safety net. Uh, why should I pick you up if you fall? Now you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, don't we want to help the poor? A universal ego ethicist would say there may be a couple reasons why we would do this. You may want to do it personally because that's something that gives you satisfaction and the poor have a value to you and you feel good when you help them. And that's fine. Uh, don't force me to share that value. Or a universal ego ethicist might say, you know, I really don't want people digging and the dumpsters. I live in an ice gated community. The last thing I want is a bunch of angry uh, people seeking their self-interest coming at my gated community with uh, pitchforks and torches. And so I am for a minimum amount of benevolence, a social safety net, so that we can keep people uh, happy enough to leave my stuff alone. So, you know, uh, you, you can have both attitudes. Again, ego ethicism doesn't require you to argue for any particular uh, social policy. You'll find liberal ego ethicists as well as the more obvious libertarian ego ethicists on the right. Uh, but uh, the, the principle is the same. People ought to do what people want to do. They ought not to be reproached for the moral choices they make. And as long as they're not hurting anyone else, and even if they are, if it's to their advantage to do so, they can get away with it. Uh, we understand the rules of the marketplace. We understand it's a rough place. And we approach life, not ideologically, 
uh, waving the banner of some uh, right or wrong that we believe has transcendent moral value. Instead, we approach life uh, as a negotiation. We're negotiational rather than ideological. The author says this system works better in limited spheres when people are isolated one with, from one another because it minimizes conflict. But as we've seen, the universal ethicist would argue there's no more conflict in our system than the system which has been in place. And this is the way we actually operate anyway. And a lot of the conflict we have is because we don't recognize the basic fact about our human nature, which is that we are selfish. And it works well when people understand the rules of the marketplace and approach life as a negotiation. Uh, the authors talk about the limitations of universal egoethicism. They say the system offers no consistent method for resolving conflict of self-interest. And again, the universal egoethicism would say that's just, well, the system may not, but it is to our advantage to have such mechanisms in place. So uh, the marketplace will figure out what it needs. And uh, the civilization will figure out what it needs. But it ought to approach this business of civilization understanding that we want to minimize the interference of government and its laws on the individual's right to pursue his or her self-interest as they would define them. Uh, while individuals operate in limited spheres, the, author, spheres, the authors argue it's much easier to maintain self-interest. Uh, but as soon as the individual or limited sphere starts to overlap, you have the conflict. And again, the universal ego ethicist would sigh and say, haven't we dealt with this objection before? Uh, some principles of justice and compromise, the authors say, must be brought in to address conflict. And the uh, universal ego ethicist would say, absolutely right, but not some abstract concept of, of justice, compromise yet. Yes, and uh, social contract, yes, because we need to operate together in a society. It's to our individual advantage to do that. Uh, but to quote the words of a song by a singer of a former generation, Billy Joel, do what you want with your own life. Leave me alone. You ethicist. The most well-known exponent of rational egoethicism was Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is the mother of libertarianism, and normally her thought is uh, identified with the right side of the political uh, spectrum, the absolute free marketeers that believe government should stay out of the marketplace completely and allow the market to take care of its business in its own way. Uh, Rand was certainly an economic libertarian. Uh, she could be considered a moral libertine. Uh, she lived her life consistently, exalting the virtue of selfishness and longing for the day when altruism would cease to be celebrated in our society and people would be encouraged to seek their own self-interest. So the foremost exponent of universal ego ethicism uh, is Anne Rand. She called it rational ego ethicism because she had a theory. She believed that self-interested individuals, if they are being rational, will never be in conflict. The author says, well, you're going to have this conflict between people seeking that which is in their own self-interest. Well, Rand had a, a, a theory called objectivism, and she was a thoroughgoing rationalist. And she was committed to the idea that through reason, all disputes can be resolved. If someone is involved in an irreconcilable difference with someone else, a one or both of those individuals is being rational. So what do you do when people are behaving rational? 
Well, that's why you have institutions in place that are, uh, you know, not directly concerned with the issues being argued before the, the, the bar of, of justice, and they can then be the voice of reason. And Rand, of course, would not be an anarchist. She would acknowledge that government has its place, but she would argue that it is to her advantage that government have certain mechanisms in place to deal with the irrational. But at a, at a philosophical level, uh, if there's a conflict, one of you or both of you are being unreasonable here. I want to give you a real life example of uh, of ethical ego egoism. You find it in some interesting places. Uh, what you see here is a picture of our former Secretary of Defense. He was a Secretary of Defense under President Obama, Chuck Hagel. I've met Hagel. Uh, Hagel is a uh, personal friend of my daughter, and he was formerly the senator from Nebraska, and uh, she knew him in that capacity uh, because she was involved for a while in Republican politics, and she found him to be a very honorable individual. Back in the day when Syria was beginning to be a problem, there were those arguing that the opposition to President Assad's government in Syria should be armed by America. And the administration was considering that uh, maybe a good thing to do at that time. And so Chuck Hagel was called to testify uh, before a congressional committee, before a House Foreign Affairs Committee. And they asked the question, can we trust these individuals we're arming? And Hegel's response is interesting, and it's a good example of the application of uh, egoethicism on the political stage. Hegel said, that's not my business to trust anyone. Uh, when the House uh, asked him, can you trust the Syrian opposition? I notice a statement. Every nation, every individual, every group responds in their own self-interest. The focus is not on good guys versus bad guys. Uh, this is a beautiful statement of ethical egoism. Uh, Hegel accepts it. He says whether you're talking about a nation state, whether you're talking about an individual, or you're talking about a group of individuals that who are working together, everyone is after their own self-interest. So he's saying we don't have to worry about whether we are arming the good guys or the bad guys over there, whether the opposition to the Syrian government is made up of good individuals or bad individuals. If they have a self-interest in bringing down uh, the Assad government, we have a self-interest in that, then we can work together. The question is not whether they're good people, bad people, trustworthy people, uh, we can trust them to do what is in their self-interest. And as long as our self-interests are aligned, uh, they will be good allies. Uh, well, uh, you know, ISIS may be called that uh, theory into question and serious questions as to whether it was a good idea for arms to be given to them through the Turks, uh, given the problem uh, that was created in Syria as a result. But you can see here an example of a thinking that's very common in political circles. Everyone is looking out for their own self-interest. Uh, it's amazing how widely believed uh, Ayn Rand's basic theories just happen to be. We move now to utilitarianism. Uh, utilitarianism is the opposite of egoethicism. It says that Everyone should follow that rule, which will bring about the greatest good or happiness for everyone concerned. If you like alliteration, utilitarianism says we should seek the greatest good for the greatest number of people. If you like Star Trek, uh, you might remember the moral theory that held together the entire Galactic Federation of which uh, Kirk and Spock and all of those on the Enterprise were a part of. 
You may remember the death scene where Spock is, is dying in the Revenge of Khan. Uh, he comes to Jim, his friend, and he's in a, behind a protective uh, barrier because he's got this communicable disease. And he tells Captain Kirk not to mourn for him. Uh, he's done the right thing because the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. That's utilitarianism, the exact opposite of egoethicism. The individual should subordinate his or her self-interest for the sake of the greater good. We should be concerned about what is in the best interest of everyone. And uh, that is the moral rule we should adopt and the moral practice we should make our habit. Act utilitarianism doesn't have to do with the law of the land necessarily. It has to do with how an individual should act on a daily basis, how you should act. Act utilitarianism says that everyone should perform that act, which will bring about the greatest amount of good over bad for everyone affected by the act. If you like alliteration, you could say it this way. Uh, act utilitarianism says you should accomplish, do the act which will accomplish the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So, in my daily decisions, I don't look out for my self-interest as a primary concern. As a matter of fact, I make the deliberate choice not to look out for my self-interest first and foremost. Instead, I ask myself how this is going to affect those who are going to be impacted by the moral choice I'm making here. It's all based on uh, that Star Trek philosophy that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, my group, or the one, me, as an individual. Uh, it's been suggested that that's kind of impractical because how do we know in advance what the situation is going to be. We can't establish rules in advance because the situations are different. The people involved in the situation are different. And we normally have to make our moral decisions quickly, sometimes on a spur of a moment. We don't have time to do the math uh, to figure out, okay, who else involved in this? How is it going to affect person A, B, and C as opposed to person D, E, F, and G? Uh, so, the speed with which we have to make our moral choices is such that it's been argued that how can we determine this uh, in advance? We have to wait till the situation and then we have to figure out what we do in the situation. And then that's sometimes difficult because uh, the speed with which we have to make our decisions in life uh, means that we don't have time to sit down with our ledger sheet and figure it all out. There are other criticisms of act utilitarianism. The author says it is difficult to determine the consequences for others. What may be a good consequence for you may not be uh, the consequence, the good consequences you imagine it will be for others in the situation. Uh, how are you going to know what is in the good of another person unless you sit down and talk with that person and, and discuss what would be good for them? And again, sometimes that is impractical. Well, as a practical matter, uh, we kind of ha have done this from the beginning of time. As soon as there has been human society, the leaders of those societies have, as a practical matter, sought to do what was in the best interests of the tribe. Sometimes they confuse the interests of the tribe with their own self-interest. But, you know, the idea of, of law, making law and lawmakers is that that's what we're trying to do. And I would say that most people living in society, unless they're an antisocial person, 
is concerned about how their moral choices are going to impact others. Uh, but the real problem with all utilitarianism, and it's a problem with egoethicism, is that to really know whether a consequence is going to be good or bad, we would need to know the future. And we don't know the future. We'll develop this a little more. The author points out that it's impractical to have to start each new situation, decide what we should do in that situation. Uh, but the argument is, are we really that unique? Are the situations we face really that different from one another? The situations we, fake, that we face in life have enough similarities that we could at least lay down some rules, uh, general or specific, based on the similarities among people and the similarities that exist in the situations which we face, which require us to make moral choices. Another objection to act utilitarianism is how do you teach the young people to do this? You want to give them some rules because certainly at their lower levels of uh, development, uh, they're not going to be able to sit down and say, okay, I should not have this cookie because how is it going to affect mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, my brother and sister who won't have the cookies? You kind of have to have some rules. How do you teach people either egoethicism, you need to be selfish, hmm. I wonder if that's a good idea to reinforce in children. Or, now you need uh, to do some math here and figure out everyone that's going to be affected by what you did here. Uh, we can maybe do a little bit of that, but it's difficult. And again, difficulty is not an argument. It would be difficult, not impossible, and maybe it's worth doing. Uh, the author says the only guy would be each person has to assess what is the greatest good consequence and act in that situation as it arises. And, and I, I suppose that would be true in the ultimate sense. But you go back to what the act utilitarian says. We have enough similar situations and human beings are similar enough that we can at least establish some basic moral rules. Which brings us to rule utilitarianism. This, are, uh, this has to do with the laws that a society passes, what the rules should be. A rule utilitarian states that everyone should always follow the rules that's going to bring about the greatest good for all concerned. So now we're not talking about actions, we're talking about the rules. People should follow those rules and by inference, uh, society should seek to make such rules. The idea again is there are similar human motives, actions, situations. And so this can be done. We can set up some rules that would apply to all human beings in all situations, or if not in every situation, certainly in most situations. Criticisms of rule utilitarianism. Well, again, it's difficult to determine consequences for others. Yeah, that is. But that's why we give our legislators the big bucks as they can try to figure that out. And at a political level, this is what we try to do in a representative government such as ours. We elect people to go and do that difficult work and try to come up with rules that would benefit most of the people. You have a law against murder that obviously is going to be a, a, a rule that is not going to work well for a murderer. Uh, but for most people, uh, that's a pretty good rule to have in your society. Uh, the author also says it would be difficult to be sure that a rule can be established to cover the diversity of human beings, which would really bring about the greatest good for all. And yeah, that's true again, but it's an observation on an argument. Once again, that's what we pay our legislators for. And sometimes it's hit and miss. Sometimes they pass a law, they say, this is going to be really good. And then they discover down the road that um, maybe not so much. But they can go and change it and try again. If at first you don't succeed, uh, try, try again. Uh, the authors bring in the educating of the young and uninitiated. Uh, I think it would be less difficult in a rural utilitarian culture because 
In fact, that is kind of what we live in when we live in a representative democracy. democracy. And our children do learn the rules of the home and they earn the rules of the culture as they go along. And certainly it is difficult to provide moral education for our children, uh, but we manage to kind of do it and we always have. And so difficulty does not suggest that it is not an enterprise unworthy of our effort. Another objection is morality is reduced to a cost benefit analysis. This is a problem for utilitarianism. Uh, how do we determine the social work of an individual, for example? Uh, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few and the one. Well, would that justify slavery? Could you be argued that the majority would be benefited by slavery? Certainly it would not be to the advantage of the few or the one individual who happens to be a slave. Um, but might it make some utilitarian sense that people who by nature have the ability to become wealthy and powerful and thereby have the ability uh, to enslave might it not be to the advantage of the majority to enslave a particular unpopular minority or even to wipe them out through genocide? You know, that was tried by the Third Reich and the argument that the Nazis made was a utilitarian argument that Europe will benefit uh, from the elimination of uh, certain individuals, particularly the Jews. Uh, so utilitarian arguments can be reduced to a, con, a cost benefit analysis. And the outcome of that uh, analysis may not always be something that we're comfortable with. Uh, the greatest good is often interpreted as the greatest good of the majority. But as in the case of slavery or genocide, that may result in immoral consequences for the minority. Um, but of course, in a utilitarian system, if the majority is benefited, then the suffering of the minority is not immoral because morality is determined by the consequence of an action. And in a utilitarian system, if, if you have uh, the majority benefiting, then what's wrong with slavery? What's wrong with genocide? Uh, what is wrong with ethnic cleansing? Uh, you see where you can get into a little bit of a problem here. Same problem exists, by the way, with uh, egoethicism. I may be powerful enough like Ivan uh, Karamazov to do what I want to do. I may be powerful enough to enslave other human beings. It is to my perceived benefit to do this. I live on an island, I enslave other human beings, I benefit from their services, it's to my advantage uh, to do this. If morality is determined by its consequences, then it's theoretically possible to justify just about anything. The author says, does a good end justify any means used to obtain it? Shouldn't we consider the means and the motives of an action rather than just cost benefit? I would say, yeah, we. I, I would agree with the authors, we should. I would ask the author though, why should we? Um, what is the basis of bringing in these ideas of good? Good ends according to who? We come to what I talked about earlier, the who says so problem. Who is to say that the ends preferred by our author are good, and the ends uh, preferred by an Adolf Hitler are bad. What yardstick is the author using when he assumes uh, the existence of good and bad? 
How so? If we're locked into a, a secular system, and if morals are a invention of society, and if we buy a utilitarian or any kind of a consequentialist argument, uh, then the ends do justify uh, the means used to attain it. So long as in a utilitarian system, the ends result in the greater good and in a egoethical system, as long as the ends uh, redound toward my personal good. Move on now to a uh, discussion of problems with consequentialist theories in general. I have actually uh, jumped the gun here. I have been talking about it for about five minutes or so. But the author recognizes that consequentialist theories demand that we discover and determine all the consequences of our actions and rules. Uh, this is virtually impossible. Uh, for one reason, there is such a thing as the law of unintended consequences. How many times have you done something, you thought this is a really good choice and it blew up in your face and it wasn't good after all? Uh, that is the problem we have when we try to figure out the consequences before an action. We might guess right, we might guess wrong. We talked about rule uh, consequentialism, the idea that you can make uh, rules in advance, and legislatures do attempt to do this. But often, the best laid plans of mice and men go amiss because mice and men don't know the future. And because of that, there are unintended consequences uh, to almost every action we participate in. Uh, you know, I'm playing football, for example. I make a block. I want to hit the guy really hard so that my running back gets through. But in doing this, I injure myself and I have to leave the game and I end up having to have surgery. Shouldn't have hit him so hard with my shoulder. I just thought I was going to be creating a hole for my running back. I didn't anticipate that in creating that hole, I would also be taking myself out for the rest of the season or that I would have continuing problems into my adult life as the arthritis sets in and so forth. Uh, or is that unintended consequence? And so you would need to be omniscient. You would have to have perfect knowledge to be a truly effective consequentialist because we don't know what the consequences of the choices we make are ultimately going to be. The author also asked, do consequences or ends constitute all of morality? And the author in asking this question is acknowledging some of the problems I've talked about. If we reduce morality to a cost-benefit analysis, if morality is about nothing more than the consequences, the moral bottom line, the consequential moral bottom line, uh, then you can justify anything. Certainly a murderer is operating on this principle from an egoethical standpoint. It is to my advantage uh, to commit this crime. Uh, the ends uh, justify the action. And the author recognizes that you need to bring some other things into the moral equation. Otherwise, you are going to have a cost-benefit theory of morality, and you're going to have things that he finds morally unacceptable happen as a result. And so he, in his own system, or I should say they, because they're the co-author, they're going to bring in, they're going to bring in some other factors as they seek to synthesize the best from all of these systems. They are going to end up with a consequentialist theory, but they're going to try to bring in things from other moral theories to keep uh, morality from descending into this simple cost uh, you know, basis for morality. We now move to care ethics, and I'm going to have a little fun with this, even though uh, uh, it's really not nice, but, you know, liven up the lecture a little bit. Uh, this was established by 
a, a, an ethicist, a philosopher, Carol Gilligan, and it's sometimes referred to as feminist ethics. And Gilligan is not the only one. Uh, for so many years, women were not allowed a seat at the philosophical table. And once women were allowed in, turned out they had some pretty good things to say. Uh, and uh, one of those who showed up with some things to say, whether it's good or not, I'll leave it to you to decide, was uh, Carol Gilligan. And she noticed, uh, now you may want to buckle your seatbelts here, she noticed there are some fund fundamental differences between men and women. Well, this has to do with more than just the obvious physical differences. Uh, the Studies by sociologists, psychologists, and so forth have determined that men and women actually think differently, and they have different attitudes when it comes to moral matters. When it comes to moral decisions, men tend to focus on justice, on rights. Men tend to be very competitive. I wonder if this is changing as a result of Title IX. Uh, as a professor here at Colby Community College, I've uh, had the opportunity to teach a number of uh, very outstanding women athletes. And uh, I, I think they're pretty competitive myself, but at least in, in moral attitudes, the studies have shown that men tend to be more competitive, uh, more focused on independence and living by the rules. Women have a different attitude. It's not that those things are unimportant, but they focus more on generosity on harmony, uh, maintaining uh, peace, reconciling when the peace has been uh, broken, and working to retain close relationships. Well, the criticisms of her theory is that on uh, Gilligan's Island, female values have been elevated over male values. And you see this uh, in the writing of some uh, feminist ethicists. They notice the differences and they have made a value judgment, which is what normative prescriptive philosophers do. And they have decided that, you know what? The feminine approach to morals and ethics is actually better than the male approach. And uh, it is the one we ought to be advancing and celebrating. And men have a lot to learn from us. Uh, there are a number of powerful women who have with this. This is Diane Feinstein. This is where I have some fun. She's a very distinguished senator. I, I found, I think, the worst possible photo ever taken of her. Uh, I hope you understand it's in good, uh, good fun. Uh, she is an outstanding uh, woman who's accomplished great things. Uh, but here's an interesting uh, quote that uh, involves a quote from her. Wesley Pruden uh, put together an article for the World Tribune some time ago. And it read, everyone agrees that something's rotten on the Potomac. The ladies of the U.S. Senate think they figured it out. It's that beastly testosterone that's making everybody but the ladies sick. We're less on testosterone, says Diane Feinstein of California. We don't have that need to always be confrontational. Now, I haven't noticed that as I've looked at the Senate, but maybe I'm missing something. She continues, and I think we're problem solvers. That's what this country uh, this is a picture of uh, a colleague of Diane Feinstein, Claire McCaskill. And in the same article, she says, having us in the room, not only do we want to work in a bipartisan way, we do it. We actually work together, Republicans and Democrats, and women try to look at solving problems rather than just going to political points. And again, I have not noticed that uh, women tend to be less partisan than men, but these uh, two accomplished women legislators, I believe they have. And in this, you hear an echo of, uh, of Gilligan, the view that the men are not as good at this as we are, that not having testosterone gives us a different way of looking at things and solving problems that is actually superior to the way uh, in which men go about the same business. Well, some criticisms. Uh, obviously, female values have been elevated over male values. 
but this would result in a little bit of a reverse discrimination. Certainly, it has been a crime that women have not been allowed to participate in the philosophical discussion, particularly when it comes to issues that affect us all so directly, uh, such as morals and ethics. But is the solution then unfairly subordinating male opinion uh, to female opinion? Uh, do two wrongs, in other words, make a right? Also, there's the possibility that feminist ethics is self-defeating uh, because if Gilligan is correct, it would tend to assign women to certain roles and men to other roles. And the roles assigned to the genders uh, would uh, tend to reflect the uh, traditional roles assigned to men and women. And women would end up then being excluded from some roles where uh, that they have fought hard to be included in. For example, think of judges. We now have uh, a lot of women judges, several on the United States Supreme Court. Women have fought long and hard for the privilege of serving on courts of justice. But if men are more concerned with justice and women, doesn't it make sense that only men should be the judges? Since women are not primarily concerned with that, uh, makes you wonder. I prefer a different theory. Also, we could associate it with Gilligan, a different Gilligan. I like the theory of Gilligan's Island, that perhaps these two points of views are complementary that one is not necessarily superior to the other, that maybe we need both. Uh, you know, there's two ways of looking at equality. You can have e egalitarian equality, or you can have functional equality. And what is wrong with everyone working together, the strengths of both sexes being brought to bear on the issues facing the human race? It kind of worked on Gilligan's Island, uh, you know, everyone had a purpose. Gilligan's purpose seems to be to try the patience of the others. Uh, but maybe that's a better way to go.